Good morning. Good to see all of your smiling faces today. Thank you for coming out and being a part of our service here at Victory Church in beautiful Chattanooga, Tennessee. Makes the service extra special because you're here. Those of you in person and those of you that are joining us online, thank you so much for tuning in. We uh, trust that God's richest and best are yours, so that's what we desire for you. I want to uh, continue this morning on a subject that we have been talking about now for uh, counting today will be five weeks. And uh, we're just looking at, now we're not going to talk about everything that the Bible has to say about this. My goodness, we, we could talk on it for well over a year. We're just kind of, as they say, hitting the high spots. But I want to, uh, t- to just share some things that will help eliminate questions because your faith will not operate where there are question marks. I know that there are people that believe you can be turning to 3 John 2, if you'd like to. I know that there are people that believe that sometimes, and I'll use this expression, I know you've heard this out in the world, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to take a leap of faith. And, and with that, they'll say, uh, you know, just, just, I just stepped out in blind faith. Well, first of all, faith is never blind. Faith always knows what the outcome is going to be. That's what faith is. Hope is the part that you set out that's your blueprint. That's the thing that you desire Faith is then the substance, this is in Hebrews chapter 11, faith is then the substance that you insert into the hope that causes it to come to pass. So faith is really important. I I have been accused, uh, and I know this is odd, but I, I have been accused. Somebody one time said, you know, you're one of those faith preachers, aren't you? Guilty as charged. I, you know, that's, that's, that's what I know to teach because that's what, causes you to be able to walk in victory in every area of your life so have we got third john 2 up yet so third john 2 uh we start here this is apostle apostle john speaking here and he says something very interesting now the apostle john knew jesus very well he was in what we we refer to jesus didn't but what we refer to is the inner circle the inner circle of his disciples would have been Peter, James, and John. And of those three, John was the closest to Jesus. So he says here in writing, he says, Beloved, I pray, or I wish, King James Bible says, that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. So he says, uh, he's telling us, he said, I, I desire, now this isn't all that he desired for him. But he said, you know, my desire for you is that you prosper and that you be in health just as your soul prospers. And we have addressed the fact that there's some people that think that when the Bible talks about money, that it's talking about, when it talks about riches, it's talking about spiritual things, spiritual riches. And there are some people that believe when the Bible's talking about healing, that it's talking about spiritual healing and we have spent time in detail several weeks ago about how when it talks about riches the word that is used there is mammon which means money it's talking about your finances you don't need riches when you get to heaven you're gonna there's gonna be more riches there than you can possibly imagine and and i want to also and i i cannot overstate this because i don't want you to think that, uh, that I am emphasizing prosperity to the point where there is error. And, and that error occurs when your attention shifts from Jesus and the things of God. It shifts from that to money. That's where the, that's where the line is. That's where you, and, and that's what we are warned about all through the Bible. Well, what we have taken and what we have been taught for years and years and years, if we just kind of lump that all into one bag and and believe that prosperity is a bad thing. Now, we have gone from one ditch, and that is that God wants everybody broke and poor, especially preachers. Do you understand that the devil's worst nightmare is a preacher with money? A preacher with money that knows what he's doing is, is the devil's worst nightmare. 
So it, it for for hundreds of years, I mean, there are there are people that have taken poverty doc or poverty vows. So that was in the body of Christ. And, and I want to share something with you. And this just ought to make sense. It is far easier for you to be a blessing to people when you yourself are blessed. That just makes, I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. And, but what happens is, is I have also seen people that have used the gospel to pursue wealth. That is an error. Jesus said, and we looked at this several weeks ago, I don't remember which one it was now, over in Matthew 6, 33, and it says, to, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first. Now, I don't know about you, but the word first to me means you need to do that first. So, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these things things i remember when we taught a few weeks ago we substituted the word stuff but i mean that's what things are things things are things you know a car is a thing a house a thing clothes are things foods things things are things stuff so seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you you know and i didn't bear this out then when i was teaching but but it 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 We'll look at it right now from a prosperity is a byproduct of pursuing God. When you pursue the things of God, you can't help the blessings of God coming on you. You can't help it. And if you'll look back through your Bible, Wherever we find, in, in particular in the Old Testament, we looked last week at Abraham. Whenever you look in the Old people that that hearts were towards God that we find, the fathers of the faith in our Bible, they were wealthy. They weren't when they didn't know God. When they went into covenant with God, they became wealthy. It's just part of the package, okay? Now, now listen, you can get to heaven and be broke, Okay, you can get to heaven with no money in your checking account. So, so how much money you have and your salvation have nothing to do with each other. How much money you have and how spiritually in tune you are with God have nothing to do with each other. Okay, there, there are people of meager means that are very close to God and, and, and they pursue God and they love God. But what I'm getting is this is if you are close to God and you pursue God and you think the right way, then these things will come upon you. That's what John's talking about here when he says, just as your soul prospers. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. Your soul is, what you, is how you think. And so what we're trying to do in this particular area is we're trying to get rid of stinking thinking. Because there's been a lot of stinking thinking where this is concerned in the body of Christ. So let's take a look a little uh, further this morning into uh, what we find the Word. So we have looked at some of the things that Jesus uh, said a few weeks ago. Then last week we looked at the story of Abraham and how God blessed him. And then how God blessed his son Isaac. And when we also found over in Galatians then if you, are Abra if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And the promise is, the promise that God made with Abraham was, surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. That's what God promised Abraham. And He blessed him to such a point, and He blessed his family to such a point, that his nephew Lot, he had so much stuff, Abraham had so much stuff that their, their herdsmen kept arguing about the, the area, the, the pasture for, the, for the, the water and for the land for the cattle to be on. So they wound up separating. And of course, Lot made a bad decision and went over towards Sodom and Gomorrah, which is a whole other story that we're not going to get into today. So I want to look at what uh, in, in the New Testament today some more about what the Apostle Paul 
has to say about this. And, and I think he does a really good job of, of dividing things. So we're going to look at that today. And then in, in, in a few weeks, we're going to look at, we're going to answer this question. Now I'm going to go ahead and pose it to you now. Give you opportunity to think a little bit. And that question is, was Jesus rich? So that will give you something to think about. We're, we're going to answer that question. And the Bible does answer that uh, question emphatically, actually. So I want you to turn with me over to Second Timothy. Chapter 2. Now, we, we come to this chapter quite often. And we, we come to it for... You see, the Apostle Paul is writing Timothy, who is a pastor. So you have in your Bible, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, two letters that we have recorded in our Bible that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. Now, Timothy is the pastor at the church of Ephesus. Now, we have a book in our Bible called Ephesians. So, if you read the book of Ephesians, and you read the, the letter of First and Second Timothy, you get a really good understanding that's written to the church in general, and then specifically to its pastor. And that's what he's doing. You can tell in, in, in uh, First Timothy in particular, uh, well, actually, both of them. You can tell the Apostle Paul, like a spiritual father, is giving Timothy instruction. And one of the things he says is, listen, don't let them despise your youth. Because Timothy evidently was very young, and so there were a lot of, you know, a lot of people in the church that didn't like the fact that, you know, that, that here this young pastor's telling us what to do, or is kind of our leader. I am glad to say I lo no longer have that problem now you know years ago i did but i don't i hadn't had that problem in quite a while so uh the apostle paul writing timothy he's giving him instruction he tells him how to pick out uh, uh elders and deacons in, in his church to serve in his church and so this is a particular thing here uh in second timothy that this is kind of as paul's getting towards the end of his ministry he's in his uh uh, you know, over in, in chapter 4, he's kind of laying the groundwork to Timothy that I'm about ready to go on and be with the Lord. We're not getting in that today. So, but we come to Timothy, Second uh, Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. We look at this a lot because this is, this is something that uh, the Apostle Paul instructed Timothy. He said, uh, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, first of all, he, you know, and, and I usually, when I say this, I say it in the King James, because that's just the way I, I learned or I'm familiar with it. And he tells him, he said, listen, he said, be diligent. Be diligent to present yourself to prove to God. King James Bible says, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I want to ask you this question. The Apostle Paul is writing a pastor. And he tells him to be diligent, and he tells him to, to uh, rightly divide the word of truth. Now, I don't know about you, but that implies to me that it's possible to wrongly divide the word of truth. Doesn't it seem to be that way to you? So, I wonder what wrongly dividing the word of truth is. Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Because wrongly dividing the word of truth is what we refer to as cherry picking. You go to a particular verse of Scripture or part of a verse of Scripture and you pick it out of its context and out of its setting and try to use it to justi justify bad behavior. <laughs> That's wrongly dividing the word of truth. You know, the, the Bible tells us in several places that by the, the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So we try to find different places in the Bible, different scripture that bear out the same truth instead of just taking one out of its context and uh, out of its setting. Remember, there's three things you need to remember when you're reading your Bible. The first thing you need to, to look at when you're reading your Bible is, 
who's doing the talking. The second thing is, who are they talking to? And third, what are they talking about? What's the subject that they're talking about? Because, li- listen, I'm glad y'all are sitting down for this part. Not all of the Bible is written to you. What? That's blasphemy. I, I didn't say that all of the Bible wasn't for you. I said not all of it's written to you. You see, there are three different groups of people primarily in the Bible that the Bible's written to. It's written to the nation of Israel. And there are things that you find in the Old Testament and in the Gospel that are specific things that are written to the nation of Israel. There are things that are written that pertain to Jewish law. Are you under Jewish law? No. Was he writing to you? No. So the, the book is written to, the Bible is written to the nation of Israel. It also addresses another group of people, Gentiles. We find that a whole lot in the New Testament. Are the books in the New Testament that are written to Gentiles, are they written to us? Yes. And then, part of the Bible is written to the heathen, the unbelievers. And I trust that that doesn't apply to anybody that's in here today or anybody that's listening. But if it is, you can change that very quickly. Now, the Bible also tells us that all of the promises of God in Christ are yes. So you know that under the law that there were blessings and there were curses that were pronounced within the law. And you find this, you find them listed in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And as you're reading down through, so, so what uh, uh, the Apostle Paul is telling us when he's writing to the Corinthians, he said all the promises of God in Christ are yes. Whenever you go to the Old Testament and you find a promise of God in there, like you find a promise over in Exodus that says, I will remove all of the sicknesses that were on the Egyptians, I'll remove from you. That's a promise of God, isn't it? Well, through Christ, you can lay hold of that promise. Behold, I am the Lord that gives thee the power to gain wealth and establish my covenant in the earth. Well, that's in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Was that written to you? No, it was written to the nation of Israel when they were going into the promised land. But through Christ, is that promise yours? Yes. How about the curses? Not, well, good news. The Bible says you've been redeemed from that part. So, actually what it is, is we get the good parts of the law, and we don't have to live under the bad parts of the law. Isn't that good? That's a good deal, isn't it? See, salvation is a really good deal. And, and you know what our part in salvation is? Is recognizing a good deal when we see it. That's, that's what our part is. It's nothing on us. God is the one that gave His life for us. He's the one that redeemed us from uh, death, hell, and destruction, from our sin, from poverty, from sickness. He's the one that did all of it. All we have to do is recognize that and accept the work of the Lord Jesus. That's it. Receive it by faith, not by works. Why? Because you can't boast if it's through works. You can't say, because I worked so hard, because I was so smart, because I read so much, because I, because I, because, you can't say because I had anything, except because I recognized a good deal when I saw it. That's what salvation is to us. So, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, according to the Bible, then you have been reunited with the Father, and your place your dwelling place throughout eternity is heaven and there is no devil in hell that can stop that but i want to share with you there is so much more that comes in that package than just going to heaven see there's a lot of people that look at salvation as fire insurance i don't have to go to hell i mean that that's the way they look at their salvation 
I'm not going to hell. Well, that's true. Yes, you're not going. You're going to heaven. But there's a whole lot more contained in that package than just going to heaven. I, when I was a children's pastor years ago, a long time ago, my hair was dark brown back then. Uh, uh, what I, the way that I would illustrate this to them is I would have a big box. Not like that nowadays when, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, you, you have Amazon boxes every day. Uh, I, you know, I, this, I, you know you, I, I had a big box and it's wrapped in a, a, a Christmas paper, you know, Christmas wrapping paper. And then on the inside of that, I would have a lot of other smaller boxes that were wrapped also. And so I would bring that. I had one of my workers and they'd be dressed up as a character and, and they'd come in. Matter of fact, one of them would do it. He had a bicycle that he rode with a basket on. He put that basket on there and he'd come in. Special delivery, special delivery for Children's Church. And he'd come up here and drop off the package. Boys and girls, let's see what we've got here this morning. Oh, look on, on this box. It says right here, salvation. Why are, this, is, this is a gift to us this morning. It's salvation. You, you know, it looks like there's something else in here. And so we'd open the, the, the box up. You know, y'all are looking at me right now just like the children. Well, y'all are sitting on your seat. Going, yeah, what's in there? What's in there? What's in <laughs> And so I'd pick this box up. And oh, look at this, boys and girls. This box, what is this box? This box says healing. So in our salvation box, we've got healing. And so I'd set it off. And, and, and what's this one? Oh, oh look at this. Look at this. this one's peace. This one's peace of mind. It's in here. And then we'd pick up. Prosperity. We've got one of prosperity. Now, one of the things I would do on prosperity is, is once a month in children's church, we would have quiet money offering. Now, do y'all know what I mean by that? Quiet money means in that offering that morning, we just want quiet money. So what's quiet money? That's dollar bills. No, no coins, no uh, uh, you know, nickels, stuff like that. And, and what I did with them is I, I started them out when they were five years old. I said, listen, boys, what I, want. I said, we're going to believe God for seed because the Bible says that God provides seed for the sower and multiplies the seed sown over Second Corinthians. And so I said, listen, this morning, I don't want you to put anything in the offering. Nothing. We're all going to pray this morning and we're going to believe God for seed. Now, this is the, this is the agreement. When you get this seed... You're agreeing to put all of that into the offering. So we prayed for each child to get one dollar. One dollar. And so when they got that one dollar, they put it in the offering. Whenever it was, it didn't matter how many weeks it took. And then I said, okay, now boys and girls, now then we're going to believe for two dollars. And, and what I want you to start doing now is, now we're going to start tithing. So when you get that $2, you get to keep this. You get to keep part of this. You're going to give God 10%. 10% of $2 is what, class? 20 cents. That's exactly right. Two dimes. Four nickels. 20 pennies. <laughs> so... I said, you're going to give that, and you get to keep the other dollar eighty. And then we went up to five dollars, ten dollars, twenty-five dollars, fifty dollars, hundred dollars. I had children in there that were twelve. I had them from five to twelve years old. I had twelve years old in there that were up to a thousand, believing for a thousand dollars, getting a thousand dollars. I had one. That had gone up to five thousand. That was believing for five. He had gotten it up to that. Teach them when they're young. I wish somebody taught me that when I was five years old. So all these packages. Well, that's the, you know that's a great object lesson with all these packages here, and and that's still true today. That that in salvation, all of these things are provided. They're not separate. So what what has prevented us from enjoying these things? What has prevented us from enjoying these things is stinking thinking. Jesus bore stripes on His back. The Bible says, and by those stripes you were healed. But we have people that want to justify why that doesn't work. I, you know, I'm pretty sure Jesus doesn't appreciate that. I, I'm sure He doesn't appreciate 
taken that beating that he had flesh torn off of his body and people say, well, you know, I just don't know if it's God's will for me. I, I mean, that's like a slap in the face. It, uh, uh, the Bible says that Jesus, oh, I can't say that one because that'll give away the answer to the question. Uh, but, but we find out that uh, uh, through the Bible, we find out that it's God's will to prosper people. That's, that's part of our covenant. So what we have to do in order to, to benefit from all these things is we have to change the way that we think and change the way we talk. Because remember, faith has two elements to it. Faith believes something and says something, gives voice to something. So you're going to have, you're not going to, remember, you're not going to have what it is that you believe. You're going to have what it is that you say. So you have to think right in order to believe right. Hey, man, this is good right here. I like this progression. You have, you have to believe right in order to think right in order to speak right now i understand technically i should have said rightly because there should have been adverbs that went there i just like the way it sounded better by doing that for emphasis so please no cards and letters about grammar okay so you understand you have to change the way that you think and that will change what it is that you believe and when you believe then it'll change what it is that you speak so these things work together. And that's what we're trying to do. And the standard that we're using to do that is, what does the Bible say? Not what we think about it. Not what our opinion is. Let's look at what the Bible says. So he says, Timothy, listen, you need to study to show yourself approved and God of work needs not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now over in verse 25, and if you don't mind, put up the King James version of this. I just, I like the way the King James words, words this particular but most of this we look at is new king james but the uh king james in verse 25 i just like better so in verse 25 uh, uh same thing the, the, he has continued this same thought all the way through and he tells timothy he says now when you do this do it in a spirit of meekness don't do this haughtily when you're teaching people teach them in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves You see that phrase? Wrongly dividing the word of truth causes you to oppose yourself. And James tells us in James chapter 1, let's just get everybody involved this. Now we'll get James and Timothy and Paul. We're going to bring Peter in here before long. I'm sure I'll work him in somehow. Teaching them not to oppose. How does somebody oppose themselves? By wrongly dividing the word. So what happens is, is you try to believe one thing, it, you're trying to believe for healing, but your mouth is speaking sickness, you're opposing yourself. And James said that's being double-minded, and let not that man expect to receive anything of the Lord. You know, sometimes, I, and I've been accused of this, sometimes I have been accused of, you know, that's just picky. Yes, I know that. Because what I know is, is the enemy is looking for any sliver, any crack that he can get in there. And remember, he has his will for you is found in John 10.10. 10. That's right. We made it to John 10.10 10 this morning. One of our favorite verses of Scripture. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. The thief is trying to kill, steal, and destroy. And he has to have an avenue to get in there, a crack to get in there. And the way that he does that, yes, he's picky. Or yes, I'm picky. Because he's looking for any crack that he possibly can to get in there and wreak havoc in a person's life. So we need to think correctly where this is concerned. All right, so you read on down in chapter 3. And we'll begin reading here in verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Wow, we, we certainly could be on the precipice of that happening, couldn't we? For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Now, when I'm teaching on the family and child training, I always come to this verse of Scripture. Because I want you to look at what disobedient... I want you to look at the company disobedience to parents keeps. 
Do you think it's important to train your children to obey their parents? The Bible does. Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. They have a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people, turn away. If, if you get around people that act this way, those instructions seem to me to be very clear. It doesn't say to appease them. It doesn't say, can't we all just get along? It doesn't say to be inclusive. It says when you get around somebody like this, that denies that they have a form of godliness. Oh, we love the Lord. We go to church. Have y'all? Has this ever happened? You've been at work. You're in the break room or something like that, and and somebody talks about that they go to church, and you're shocked when you hear that. What? You go to church? I mean, they have a foul mouth. They're mean. They, you know, they stuff. And, and when they mention something back, and then usually this is what follows. Yeah, I go. I, I'm a deacon. Sweet Lord Jesus. Yeah. There are people all over the place in churches that have a form of godliness. But they deny the power of God. And the Apostle Paul says, get away from them. From such, what does turn away mean from you? It means get away from them. So, all of this, the, the, uh, the, he, he's talking about, and one of the things that I want to zero back in, um, in, in verse 2, it says that for men will become lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Not just trying to get their bills paid, but they get to where they love money. Because this is what happens, and this is one of the, where, where we sometimes get um, kind of get skewed in our thinking, is we look at Jesus talking about it, how hard it is for a rich man to get into heaven, it, it, you know, like a, a camel going through the eye of the needle. Now, we looked at that several weeks ago in, 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 in the disciples' reaction when Jesus said how hard it is for the rich to, to inherit, inherit eternal life. The Bible says his, the apostles that were standing with him were astonished. And he said, verily, how hard it is for those that trust in riches to enter into heaven. The Bible says they were astonished above measure. That means really astonished. Now, if they had been taught that being poor was godly, they wouldn't have had that reaction. They didn't understand. What do you mean rich people can't go to heaven? You know, if they were broke, if the, if the disciples were broke, and Jesus made the statement, oh, how hard it is for the rich to inherit uh, the kingdom, the disciples would have said, well, shoot, we're a shoe-in because we're so broke we can't pay attention. Shoot, we have, we've got it made. But that was not their reaction. You'll have to go back and listen to that. So here he's saying people that love money, people that pursue money. And back over in 1 Timothy um, chapter 6, he, he addresses this also in the first letter that he wrote to Timothy. I, like, I wanted to get the fullness of the, right, the dividing words the reason we went to 2 Timothy first. So in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 6, we'll pick it up here in verse 3. I can already tell I'm not going to get to the shipwreck this morning. I can just tell. We're, we're not going to be able to get to the shipwreck. We will next week. If any, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words. I love, he says this several times. Paul does. He said, listen. If, you're here, if you hear people preaching differently than I am, get away from them. They don't know what they're talking about. And see, I like that boldness right there. That's confidence right there. If they do not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, 
He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, uh, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. In other words, using godliness to pursue gain. From such withdraw yourself. Now does that sound similarly to what he said that we just read? From such turn away, from such withdraw yourself. In other words, listen. Paul would not have done good in a woke society. The Bible does teach you to walk in love. It does not teach you to cater to sin. I'm not going down that road right now. That's a whole, that's a whole other sermon right there. But I want you to notice how bold he is about this. You get away from these people. Do not spend time with them. From such, now godliness... With contentment is great gain. For we have brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we can take nothing out. And having food and clothing with these things, we shall be content. Now, he's not telling you to be broke. He's saying, whatever state you're in, be content in the things of God. Be content in godliness. Now, I would imagine that it's true with each person in here. There have been times in my life, like when I was going to school years ago, uh, there have been times that I have been without. And there have been times that I have been with. And I can tell you that being with is a lot better than being without. You know, being without or having lack didn't make me closer to God. And people think that. They think, listen, if that were true, then all of the third world countries would be spiritual giants. But that's not true. As a matter of fact, oftentimes where you find poverty, you find uh, godlessness. So, what the Apostle Paul is saying is, whether you're rich or or whether you're poor, whether you have or whether you have not, be content in God. Be content where you are. Trust in God. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. Here again, the thing that he's talking about is pursuing it, desiring to go after it. They fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts. <laughs> Pyramid schemes come to mind, but that's, a, that's another for another. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now, then verse 10 is probably the, the one of the most misused verses of Scripture in the Bible. Verse 10. What The way that most people quote this verse of Scripture is, they say money is the root of all evil. Have y'all ever heard that before? Money's the root of all evil. That's why I like being broke, because I'm not evil. That's not what this verse says. And remember, read things in their context. What he said, He's talking about pursuing money. And so in verse 10, he says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. These are people they have turned and they're pursuing money and have gotten away from the things of God. And since they have gotten away from the things of God, since they're not rightly dividing the word of truth, since they're not being diligent to be a workman of the Lord, the enemy finds interest and wreaks havoc in their life. Listen, if, if a person that is ungodly, excuse me, doesn't even have to be that, could, could be a Christian, comes into a lot of money. Have y'all ever heard this situation? Well, you know, that money just ruined them. They got that inheritance. 
And uh, the money just ruined them. Ruined them. I knew it would. I knew it would. You know, money's the root of all evil. The Bible says that. Well, what happened was, first of all, in Proverbs chapter 1, it says that prosperity will destroy a fool. So they were foolish. Another thing when they come into a lot of money like that, what happens is, is if they are not prepared for it, their security shifts from God to the money. Well, guess what's going to happen? Guess where the devil's going to attack? He's going to come with all kinds of plans for them to lose that money. And then they're going to be out here like a sheet in the wind. That they're just going to go whichever, wherever they get blown, just wherever they go, wherever the wind blows. Prosperity and your attention still on the things of God is a powerful tool. Now, I started to say this while ago, and I got side, sidetracked, and I'm sorry, but occasionally that happens to me. I do get sidetracked. But I was going to make this statement earlier when we were talking about uh, prosperity with a Christian. The reason it's important to understand prosperity for you as a believer is because it is a standard that God uses to, to bless or to give you reward. Remember, Jesus said, if you're faithful in unrighteous mammon, then you will be faithful in the true riches. It's in the same passage. He who is faithful in a little will be faithful in a lot. Then he says, he who is faithful in the unrighteous mammon will be faithful in godly things. So money is the tool that is used where faithfulness is concerned for you to have spiritual responsibility on the earth. And and this is the way that I was going to word it earlier. I've worded it this way before. Money is the lowest form of power that a believer will ever operate. The lowest. Most people are trying to attain wealth like it's the highest. For a believer, it is the lowest power you will ever deal with. And Jesus said, if you can't be entrusted with unrighteous mammon, then how will you be given the true riches? You can't. If you're not faithful with your money, then you won't be faithful in spiritual things. So it's really important. Really important. Verse 11, But, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience. So now he's telling you, don't pursue the money, pursue these things. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called to have a confession of good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnesses the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing which He will manifest in His own time. He who is blessed, only the potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Verse 17. That's why I read that quick. I'm trying to get to verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives... (laughs) But in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So he is not saying to shun wealth. He's saying turn your attention on the things of God. It's God that gives you richly all things. What does all things mean to you? It means all things. I looked that word up in the, in the original Greek, and I found out that that word all there actually it means all. Yeah. And the word things, they had a picture of a little Volkswagen odd-looking vehicle. That, yeah. I jest. 
Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give and willing to share. Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. This is the way you act when you're a believer. God blesses you richly in all things. And when He does that, we're supposed to freely be quick, ready to give willingly, not begrudgingly, not of necessity. Hallelujah. I've got one more verse of Scripture that I need to... I, I know we're running a little long here this morning. Just real quick. Real quick. And I'm going to come back to this next week. But I, 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 I need to get to this to, to kind of cap this off this morning. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. You're going to love this verse of Scripture. This is a verse of Scripture you need to put to memory. When you get, when you look at your checkbook and your finances and you have more month than you do money, you know what I'm talking about? This is a really good verse of Scripture. I, I cannot count the number of times I have used this verse of Scripture over the years. The Apostle Paul says, And my God shall supply all your need now, I want you to notice, it's not plural. Because he could categorize his need in one th as one thing. It's one thing in your life that manifests itself in a lot of different areas. But my God shall supply all of your need, look at the standard, according to your checkbook. No, didn't say that. According to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's the standard that God uses to meet your need. In other words, God has plenty. The, the worst financial need you could possibly have, God has more than enough to meet that. He's not going to run out. God is able to provide your need according to His, not according to your ability, according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Now that's a good place to stop right there. We'll stop there and we're going to pick it back up next week right here after a brief review. Thank you so much for being here this morning. You're God's best and God's champions. I love each and every one of you. My desire for you is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there's victory in Jesus. Amen. As I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increased. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs. I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say amen.